All right, we're here today for our Monday review, talking with Brother Nathan Iry, pastor of People's Baptist Church. And so, Brother Nathan, how are you doing today, brother? Doing well. No complaints. Have a good day yesterday? Yeah, I had a real good day yesterday. Have, uh, let's say, you, you have uh, people coming back, I guess, you, uh, if you're like other places, you got some folks that maybe was out, or have you had anybody out from COVID? Are they coming back, yes or no? Not really. We haven't had a whole lot of folks out. Well, at least in Folkestone, we haven't had a whole lot of folks out. Yesterday up in Brunswick, we did have uh, one family come back since they've been out. We had several cases go around up there, so we lost a lot of folks as far as staying out for a couple of extended weeks. But other than that, they had one family come back, and then nobody really from Folkestone has been out. So That's good. That's real good. We we had the same thing yesterday. We had a we had a lot of people in service yesterday morning, a lot of bus kids and and uh, which that really surprises me that uh, that people are letting their kids come to church on the bus. But that, that's good. That's a good indication that people are not too frightened right now. I think the news media is trying to frighten people, and and that's not to say there's nothing to be um, cautious about. We certainly should be cautious about about all this stuff but at the same time trust in the lord and um we haven't had any cases of covid in a long time been a real long time but at any rate um uh, back to the attendance thing we had a good we had a good turnout yesterday uh, of our people and then had a lot of visitors had uh, one fella get saved in the morning service and one in the evening service uh, we had a young man named Olin from the church uh, on the bus several weeks ago and got saved. And he brought his brother with him yesterday and his brother got saved. His mom came with him. So that's good. That's, that's the way I like, that's the way we got into church. I rode the bus and me and my brothers, and then my parents started coming and one thing leads to another. That's the way it's supposed to work. So uh, that was real good. We enjoyed that yesterday. Now, uh, so uh, that's a, um, we didn't really talk. I, I think we touched on a little bit last week, but uh, we recorded last week. I didn't even publish it because I, it was it was it was very long, and I didn't have time to uh, run it through the the computer and process it. If it takes an hour to process, it could take three or four hours to run through. Uh, so, but at any rate. Uh, I, I never got around to doing it, but uh, Sunday school, uh, I suppose you taught Sunday school yesterday and preached three times? Uh, right, yeah. Well, no, I taught Sunday school, preached Sunday morning, preached Sunday afternoon in Brunswick, but Wyatt preached last night here at the church. Oh, little Wyatt. Yeah, he did a good job too. And he got saved during the revival in January. Or is that the brother? Uh, I can't remember when he got saved, to be honest I, with you. I think but, Wyatt got saved in uh, in January at the, at the meet. That that may be true. He watches all these Monday reviews, so he's going to come and tell me as soon as Wednesday night rolls around. Yeah. I feel bad for not being able to remember. But I know he, he felt like he was called to preach at youth camp when he came home. On the way home, he had questions about it. So anyways, we've been praying with him about that. So he came to me, this was Sunday night. He came to me Wednesday night with an outline. He said, I got this together. Would you take a look at it for me? I looked at it. I said, be ready to preach Sunday night. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. No, I think, uh, I think Marshall got saved in the, in the uh, January, in the January meeting. That may be true. That, yeah. That may be true. That sounds very accurate. Marshall's the younger one, right? Right. Yeah, Marshall got saved in the in the uh, January meeting. Yeah. And yeah, so that that's 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 good. At any rate, Marshall's still a little young, but he'll he'll come along. Yeah. So what did Wyatt let's let's start with the evening service then. Let's hear let's hear about how Wyatt did. 
I should have had him here today. He could have explained it. He preached about faith, and uh, he was just talking about having faith and being faithful. And so he ran through several different biblical characters, David going up against Goliath and Noah building the ark and being faithful. He talked about uh, there's a couple of others. Oh, he talked about what happens when, you, when you're not faithful. He talked about Jonah getting swallowed up by a whale. He used that as an illustration to talk about if you're not faithful, you get swallowed up by sin. So, uh, And then there was, uh, I think, one more biblical character that he used. I don't remember what it was. I can't remember off the top of my head. It was real good. He, he did a real good job. Had a lot of his family there last night. Uh, you know, his mom and dad, and obviously his brother uh, Marshall was there, but then he had, he had cousins, he had his aunt by marriage. His grandmother was there. Uh, and he packed house last night just to hear him preach. Yeah, that's good. Somebody somebody told me, one of the young guys in the church told me, and you need to let Wyatt preach more often. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's nice preaching to, to people. It is. It's a great blessing. Yeah, that, that is a great blessing. A great blessing. Yeah, and he did, he did real well, man. He preached about 15 minutes. I, I'm more embarrassing. I, I know I'm more embarrassing, but I don't care. He uh he came to me before the service, and he told me, he said, I think he got enough material to go about a half hour, because I didn't put any time restraints on him. I just went preach what's on your heart. And uh, he said, I think I got enough material to go through half, about half an hour. I said, okay. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, We'll see how fast you roll through that stuff. Because I, you know, you know how fast you run through notes. It's been about 15 minutes. So I, you know, it was good. I was, I was glad he, he lasted 15 minutes. Yeah. And I was thrilled to death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, unfortunately, if you gave me 15 minutes worth of note, I'd turn it into three hours. But that's... <laughs> But that's because God's whooping most of the people that I preach to. So, <laughs> but at any rate, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's always a wild thing, man, to see how, uh, now I guess you can be polished and professional enough to, uh, you know, line it, line out your sermon and make it last 30 minutes exactly. And I suppose you can do that stuff, but I never have been able to even stick with an outline that I made up. Yeah, man. So at any rate, uh, last night I had one of those situations where I had a I had a verse in my mind, but I had the wrong reference. Uh, both of the verses I was using in the sermon, but the one verse that I wanted to use, I gave the other reference for it. When I turned to it, I was like, "No, nah, this ain't it, man. I can't stand that, man. I, I mean, it just." It, I could feel my face turn six shades of red. I was like, no, nah, that ain't it. Somebody in the congregation was like, yeah, that was it. I'm like, what do you know? You're not the one up. You're not, you know. Uh, I was like, that's not it. Because I was thinking of a verse in Ezekiel, but I gave a reference somewhere else. And, and that I did have that other verse down there, but I didn't want to. Anyway, um, I'm... I'm I have to get uh, in more trouble going by an outline than not. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> just the way it turns out for me. So uh, travel error will really throw you off. Yeah. Said. But it, the the Lord humbled me a little bit because I had it all, I had it all wrote out the right verse. I just had one verse in mind. I got ahead of myself, and I gave the first reference. It was the wrong. It was the wrong deal. Right verse, wrong time. So the outline got me yesterday. I used, I actually preached three times yesterday and used three outlines. First time I've done that in probably five or six years. Wow. So, but at any rate, it is what it is. Trying to be more prepared because, you know, um, as you get older, your mind don't, your mind don't work like it once did. In being safe, I messed myself up a little bit, but it's all right. I needed the the humiliation. We all do. 
need the humiliation. I, sometimes I catch myself being high-minded. We got to watch out for that, for sure. But at any rate, let's talk about, <clears throat> let's talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, let's talk about Sunday morning. Uh, how'd y'all do in Sunday, Sunday morning? So I don't mean just by how many came, uh, good spirit, all that stuff. Talk about that a little while. It was, it was pretty good. Uh, the Sunday school, not, not during Sunday school this past week, but the one before, it's a little bit tight. But this last week, or I'm sorry, yesterday was a lot. There's a lot more liberty in there yesterday. Uh, we've been going through Ephesians 5, and so I was talking about the will of God and being filled with the Spirit, how they're connected. And so I had a lot of a lot of material that I was trying to cover yesterday, and thankfully I got through most of the material I wanted to get through, and ended that Sunday school lesson talking about Moses going up and getting the pattern for the tabernacle, and then when he came down, before he came down, God told him, "Well, I've given you two fellows that are going to basically do that work: Bezalel and Eliab." Aholiab, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I just do my best when I'm <laughs> but anyways. Uh, but he told him, he said, I'm giving you these guys. They're going to do the work. And he said, I filled them with, in some places, he says, I filled them with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding. And in other places, he says, I've, I've filled them with the spirit of understanding or the spirit of wisdom. Really just depends on where you're reading that. But those things are in the book of Exodus. So I was just trying to draw the connection between this matter of being filled with the Spirit of God and knowing what God's will is, having the understanding of the will of God. And so it went over real well. I think part of possibly part of what some of the tightness was, the lack of liberty. I, I don't really want to say uh, tightness, but lack of liberty last week was maybe just not able to convey what I was trying to get across yesterday went a lot smoother so so it was a lot better spirit in there uh, as far as I could tell and then yesterday morning getting the part of the passage there in Ephesians 5 where it's talking about wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord and then he uses that illustration of he says you're supposed to do this because the husband husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And I know I myself, when I go across that passage, at least for several years now, when I've been preaching, I always emphasize wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives. But yesterday I didn't really deal with that. I just dealt with the fact that Christ is the head of the church. And uh, so, man, I had a good time yesterday morning. It was it, I believe it was exactly what needed to be preached and had a lot of liberty. Uh, felt like the Lord was, I don't know, sometimes you preach the truth, but you don't really feel like that identifying mark of the Lord's got his hand on you. But yesterday I felt like the Lord was, had his hand on it, blessing it. You know, yeah. as far as how people responded or whatnot, that's entirely between them and the Lord. But felt like I did what I was supposed to do. So that's pretty yeah. blessing. What a difference a week, a week makes, huh? Yeah. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. We we talked about that somewhat last week. Uh, like I say, it didn't get uh, posted last week for time constraints and stuff like that. But it, it's so much better when you, when you, for lack of a better phrase, feel what you're what you're talking about and you it's well digested and even if it's well digested sometimes you can just be out of it and it uh you you walk away feeling like a service is ruined kind of like running the wrong reference like i did like what i was talking about a while ago but um it can even be like from morning to night just something feel like it's out of place oftentimes it's perceived rather than something that's that's actually going on, but um, I had a lot of liberty yesterday as well, but then trying to uh, get our Bible classes done this morning, I, I couldn't do it. I got the survey classes done. There's no, there's no great feat to that, 
but got into Romans 3, talking about simple stuff, justification, remission, propitiation. I just couldn't get through it. I'd go 15 minutes and then get mind lock, and I'd be like, man, delete. And then so I, I'll just go on to 1 Thessalonians and uh, know the material. Uh, I did approach it from a little bit different standpoint. You know, we all we always teach Second Advent stuff. We teach about the coming of the Lord, uh, how it's going to happen, different stuff like that. But that's not really the context. How it's happening is not the point in 1 Thessalonians 4, the point of that is that you be not troubled in mind. Uh, I'd rather give you the, let me give you the actual statement rather than, he says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. That is the context of that whole passage right there from 13 to 18. It starts, I don't want you to be sorrowing, Verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. The context begins and ends with, uh, with the Christian's perspective of, of their saved loved ones, and it ends with the same. There's, everything about it has something to do with the Christian perspective now. Not necessarily. It gives you some perspective of the coming of the Lord then when it actually happens but the context is dealing with how you see the death of saved loved ones in relation to the coming of the lord not it's trying to teach that over and above uh, any aspect of the second advent itself or the rapture itself so he, he says that you saw or not as others which have no hope if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also, the, the people that are asleep, the people that have passed away, they're still in the context there. Them also will, uh, he's even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. But anyway, I was trying to go through all that stuff and coming at it from a little bit different standpoint, you know, I could have run it to second thessalonians and over to revelation and did all sorts of stuff like that but teaching through the books i just wanted to hit it as it was in its context and i wasn't feeling that either so i hit the lead on that and i'll do those some other time that's just what you know when yesterday very little problem today just no liberty yeah. done the survey classes and checked out <laughs> that's when i called you and said hey let's hit this thing this morning we'll be done with it Right. right. But at any rate, man, it's a, uh, um, I, I would say because, you know, Monday, Monday review is supposed to be something that could help, you know, other preachers that don't, you know, probably most preachers have a buddy they can call, but this, you know, sometimes, you know, it feels like the loneliest job in the world, pastoring a church 900 miles from all your friends and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, maybe somebody, get on here today and say, hey, other people going through this stuff, a lot of the problems that we perceive might be with our congregations. You know, I've heard it many times. There's a dead spirit in here, y'all. You know, that might be, you know, it might be some spiritual hindrance or some physical carnal hindrance going on, but it might just be the perception of the guy behind the pulpit. And that can do a lot of damage, depress a guy, um, discourage a guy, I should say, even to the point he might, you know, quit prematurely. Yeah, yeah that, that perception alone can cause a guy to panic. I speak for myself. It causes yeah, me panic. And in that panic, you do a lot of damage. Yeah, no doubt. And, uh, and the thing for me, the sad thing for me is, is, is I only figure out that it was perception maybe the next day and i've told you a thousand times i have a lot of problems on monday but and, and i say that now but that that didn't that doesn't usually help next time i i get five minutes into a sermon feel like it's oozing out of the corner of my mouth and down the side of the pulpit you know uh 
if we could figure that stuff out while we're preaching, we might could recover. And I guess that makes the that's what makes the difference between a profound professional guy and I, i'm not i'm not looking to turn into a profound professional you know master of articulation god didn't even look for that when he called people to preach according to first uh, corinthians chapter one but even with that being said sometimes i perceive it and it i'm five minutes into the sermon it ruins you know a 45 minute sermon because i'm gonna still preach what I came to preach. I can't just say, well, I ain't feeling it. Let's just quit and go home. I can't do that. But if I could catch it five minutes in, readjust my attitude on the fly, I might could, you know, resurrect some sermons from the dead, even though I have not that divine power. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about it. So what 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 did you go over in the uh, the morning service? And, and as I say that, that you um, did the attendance pick up from Sunday school to the morning service, or did you have about the same? Uh, I think we thinking about it. Uh, no, I think it was about the same. If I remember, we got maybe one or two families that sometimes are not able to come to Sunday school. But other than that, it's pretty faithful. Uh, had a big, had a big uh, influx Sunday night because of Brother Wyatt preaching. But yeah, that's that, Sunday school Sunday mornings about about the same. Of course, all the, they come in from the back, you know, from their little Sunday school classes. So it, it, there are more people, more bodies sitting in the auditorium. Oh yeah, but but other than that, it's pretty pretty consistent. Yeah, that church is always, well, I don't know about always, but um, from my recollection, there was always a pretty consistent crowd there from S Sunday school on through Wednesday night service, which is a, which is a rarity and something to be thankful of, thankful, yeah. uh, thankful for on your part as, a, as the pastor there. All right, so Sunday morning service. Who sang? Uh, let's, let's start with that. Who sang? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't even remember. Last night, I know it was uh, Miss Joyce and Miss Heidi and Miss Callie. Uh, well, I don't remember who sang yesterday morning. I know it wasn't me. Does that count for anything? <laughs> Wouldn't you? So we know it was somebody else. Okay, we can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who did I, the I, preaching? I who, Do you remember? <laughs> I know who didn't sing. Yeah. Uh, I know the congregation sang. Yeah. Well, that's Her good. I was having a hard time singing yesterday morning. I have a hard time uh, trying to figure out how to salvage my voice on Sundays now. Uh, I hate to do it, man, but I, I, trying to figure out how to throttle back on Sunday mornings and not preach so hard because if I preach hard, Sunday afternoon I'm toast and Sunday night it's over. I, I can, I'm about whispering just from preaching so hard. And then if I if I sing during the congregational singing, which I love, I love singing as loud as I can during the congregational singing. Boy, my voice can't handle it. So, well, yes. you know, I'm not a, a as far as your voice carrying all the way through the day preaching several times. That's uh, I don't know. There might be some. Uh, there might be some. I wouldn't know of any spiritual based materials there there probably is some secular based materials that you could look up as far as public speaking and voice preservation i'm sure that there's something like that out there but as far as singing goes and i'm not a i'm not a big um the guy's name just slipped off of my tongue but anyway i'm i'm not a Oh, I wish I could remember that preacher's name. Uh, I'm not a big follower of his preaching. I've got some of his books. I've got some of his books. I, it's not worth wasting the dead air to, uh, to look for them and find them, but uh, Spurgeon, is it Spurgeon that I'm thinking of? 
Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon. Yeah, I'm not a big fan, uh, uh, really. Fan's not a good word to use when you're talking about preachers. I'm not a big follower of uh, of Spurgeon, but I like the way they ran their service, which was congregational singing and then preaching. That was it. And yeah. um, there's a lot to be said about the mindset of the people and how people like entertainment and stuff like that and but that being said i'm a i'm a fan of that really of a focused a more focused service so if a guy cut back on some of the extracurriculars that go on during the service it wouldn't bother me it doesn't bother me if people do it but it doesn't wouldn't bother me if if i went to a church service personally and it was two hymns and a sermon um, and I was being fed. I think the two the two songs or three songs wouldn't make any difference. Yeah. Um, I think actually I prefer two, but I don't. I'm not upset if there's three or four, but a couple of songs and and a uh, a good sermon would be sufficient for me from the viewpoint of uh, somebody in the congregation. And I suppose if the if the flock of God was being fed, I suppose it would be sufficient for the congregation as well. So you know, sure. I think I think people kind of cringe at the idea of holding back, but uh, if it's done in the right way, and you know. Uh, has good effect. I, I wouldn't see any problem with that at all. Yeah, yeah. The, the issue is trying to figure out how to throttle, throttle my voice, and not be boring at the same time. Yeah. Oh, I I know. I I, I think uh, I think I prefer a, an even, steady keel. Yeah. Uh, I mean, who I am, how I was raised, um, the preaching I grew up with, it kind of predisposes you towards some type of dynamics. I think personality is involved. You and I are, are great friends, but we, we do have divergent personalities in some areas. Um, people who can be more or less demonstrative. I think personally, like, I like to hear um, I like to hear preachers go full throttle and I like to hear a guy like Martin Lloyd Jones just lay it out in a very educational type of a format too. I, I mean, so I don't have a preference there. Sure. And I think there's been more than a few times that I've got a message and, and knew it was God's message and went in and kind of laid it out dry and regretted that. And then other times I know I've had the right message, but laid it out too dynamic or too throttled up, as you say, and regretted that. And then other times felt at perfect peace doing it both ways. So there's no hard, fast rule, especially when preaching with God called a bunch of fools to do it. And um, the opposite of noble, whatever that is, in noble, <laughs> you know, fools. And uh, so... I don't think there's hard, fast rules, but like I say, there's probably some kind of self-help thing out there somewhere that would probably help you. If you preach three or four times, that's that's one thing. Add to that an extra service and an extra midweek service as well and a radio broadcast, your voice begin to have some problems. Yeah, I think there was a preacher named McDonald that had some serious McDougal or McDonald. Anyway, he came through here 12, 13 years ago, and that guy had some serious problems with his voice mm -hmm. uh, that ended up being pretty long term. And I imagine if you don't take care of yourself, you might you might could run into some problems like that. Yeah, it's a very, the throat's a very resilient muscle, but man, 
boy in the moment, boy, it's really, it's a, it can get exhausted very quickly. I've tried to stay hydrated and that always helps, but um, I'm not very good at staying hydrated. Yeah. I never drink water in the pulpit and I, 99.9% <clears throat> of the time I don't drink any water before or after preaching. So I should probably watch that myself too. But at any rate, um, we could probably talk about that. <laughs> Welcome to the Treat Your Voice Well program. Right. <laughs> Dr. Nathan Iron. <laughs> Let's go ahead and talk about that morning service. What did you preach yesterday? Uh, yesterday, I was just preaching about Christ being the head of the church and just went through some various aspects about uh, what it means to be the head and really talking about being the, the head of the body. And so talked about the value of the head and, you know, when you get in a fight, which I don't know a whole lot about, but I do know watching boxing, you know, you protect your head. When you're in warfare, when you're in battle and bullets start flying, you keep your head down because that's the most valuable part of your body. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, you don't want to get shot in the chest. You don't want to get shot anywhere, but especially shot to the head, you're, it's over. Get shot in the arm, there's a chance you'll make it. Shot in the leg, chance you'll make it. Shot in the head, chances are slim to none you're going right. to come out surviving. So just try to use things like that to just reemphasize the fact that the most valuable part of the body of Christ is the head. Jesus yeah. Christ and how that Webster when he defines the word head it's funny he defines it as the uppermost part of the human body or the foremost part of prone and creeping animals so it's it's the first thing that you should notice all right and so when people look at the body of Christ the first thing they should not notice necessarily is the members of the body you're going to notice that but that's not really the first thing that should be noticed the first thing that should be noticed is who's the head jesus christ that's the first thing that should be noticed first person amen um, it, it was it went over uh, very well and it, i mean kind of feel a little foolish saying it went over well but man it was a great blessing to me it i think that was one of those messages that was really uh, more for me because it was a good reminder for myself that, you know, and everything that you're trying to learn to do as far as being a pastor and being a good Christian and trying to fill whatever uh, roles that you're trying to fill, the most important thing still, as always, is still Jesus Christ. So it's a yes, great, great reminder for me. And you know what they say, what's good for the goose? Good for yeah. the gander. It'll be good for everybody. It'll be real good for everybody. Now, I know you got midweek service coming up, but you got, uh, you already, what, what do you got looking forward to for next week? Y'all got anything special going on or sermons already popping in your mind for next Sunday or what you got? No. Uh, I mean, we're going through Ephesians 5. I will probably stay in Ephesians 5 for Sunday school. It's kind of a thing to where I've been, preaching and teaching out of Ephesians 5, kind of going through things, trying to just figure out what the Lord leads on. But I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do for next Sunday morning quite yet or Sunday evening for that matter. Uh, I've got a message put together out of Ephesians 5 that we may possibly look at on Wednesday night, but I'm going to kind of keep in my, my heart open as far as the direction that the Lord might want, want me to go. I'm not quite sure about that yet. Yeah. I know you've got a revival coming up in uh, in October. That's a little over a month away. And uh, we've got a ladies' meeting coming up in October. So we're looking forward to that ladies' meeting. Uh, I think we're supposed to go and ordain a brother up in Pennsylvania this week. So we'll be doing that. Some things to look forward to as far as that goes. <clears throat> Next week, uh, I'll only be doing Sunday school. I preach the whole day on the first Sunday of each month. So that was yesterday. Next Sunday, I was thinking of dealing with that uh, covenant of Abraham and the terminology that the Bible uses 
right there, beginning with Abraham of being cut off from the people. So basically be talking about the, uh, the old, uh, basically, and it's boiled down form, be talking about salvation in the Old Testament yeah. and relating that people being cut off from the people as a blessing of the New Testament that um, salvation is complete in Christ, whereas the law, the law secondarily and circumcision primarily uh, presented some pitfalls. Yeah. And that, uh, if you need an example of that, you know, Moses' son being uncircumcised when God's about to give him the law is a great example of that, you know, the, the law uh, has a curse, even though it's holy, it has a curse attached to it. And the covenant of Jesus Christ has no such curse. And basically a, a roundabout way of emphasizing eternal security using the example of Old Testament, uh, of an Old Testament covenant with, between God and Abraham. But, you know, there, a lot of times, and, and I don't agree with this, uh, it's taught and people have a right to believe, read the Bible and believe I'm not being down on anybody. I don't believe anybody has ever been saved by works in the past, in the present or in the future. Yeah. I don't believe salvation is the same in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. It's not even close to being the same. Right. But there is some typology. That, well, I will say. I say it's not even close to being the same in a way, in a sense, that's true. But uh, in another sense, it's, it's, it's very divergent. But in the sense that we're saved by the merits of Jesus Christ, like the Israelites uh, after the flood were placed into the covenant of Abraham for the faith that he had. Right. It's similar to New Testament salvation. So I'm going to give the, the differences and the similarities. And the law definitely was instituted, but they weren't saved by keeping the law. If that was the case, the Pharisees would have been in pretty good shape. Yeah. Uh, but they misinterpreted the law and the law, they failed to see the curses that were involved in it. And most of those curses involved with the law would take you out of the covenant of Abraham. So I'm going to try to prove that, uh, which I think is, is with the help of the Lord, that'd be pretty easy to show that from the scripture. So also just thinking about, you know, we don't spend a lot of time reviewing what went on here yesterday, but over the last couple of hours, I've been thinking about brevity. And, and on one hand, I think sermons ought to be three hours long. Yeah, uh, but in another sense, you know, thirty minutes is good. But I, I would I'll never say, you know, a sermon ought to be thirty minutes and it ought to be less than an hour, and you ought to be out at twelve o'clock. I would never say that. But just in my mind, I'm going to try to, whenever I put together sermons, and I, it's kind of a, a loose commitment. You can't say what you're going to do from week to week, but. What I would like to do for myself is to condense things down to where I can say things better, to where it takes less time to do it, say more in less time. Uh, and that's just something that I've been thinking about doing over the last couple of weeks, just to improve what I'm doing, how I'm doing. I think a lot of preachers would maybe um, gain an advantage or, and congregations would gain and congregations would gain a benefit from preachers trying to improve what they're doing and to assume that hey i'm a great preacher which i don't think very many people think that way of themselves but in a sense all of us probably recognize what god has allowed us to do gave us a gift to do we know what our strong points are, and most of the time we focus on those. If somebody pointed out one of our weak part, one of our weak points, we'd probably get mad at them, not speak to them for a while until we needed something else from them. <laughs> but, but I find that to be generally true. I generally think about the and the, the reason I do it, 
I guess you could say the flesh is involved and there's some pride involved. But generally a man likes to, uh, I'll use the analogy of fishing. If I go to the, to the creek and throw in a worm and catch a big old bass, then I'm gonna keep using the worm. And if you give me some plastic lure, I'm like, man, I'm not gonna use that because what I got's already working. And in that sense, you know, I know what works for me and it'd be easy just to be satisfied with that and go on and let that continue to work and let the, the flaws exist right there in it. But if there's a way of condensing things and saying things better and saying what you got to say and, and cutting it a little bit shorter, I think I can work on that. And so basically I asked you a little bit ago what you got to look forward to. And that's just an example of what I'm looking forward to. How can I start condensing these things? And I already have in the, um, on Sermon Audio, we put our Bible classes up. I've already started what, when I was doing you, the classes for you guys in Georgia, about 30 minutes is what I was trying to get. Now I've, in the new Romans class, I've cut those down some of them get up to 30 minutes, but some of them have been cut down 13, 14, 15 minutes. Yeah. But I feel like they're saying just as much as the, as the older classes were saying. Yeah. And so that, that's what got me thinking in my own head. Why not try to do that for pulpit delivery as well? And I think all of us could stand to be challenged to, uh, sure go over our process. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. You are who you are. I am who I am. I'm not saying that, but little improvements can always be made. You know, with the world the way it is, we could stand to uh, to sharpen up our games. What say you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I, uh, thing I've been trying to keep my mind wrapped around is uh, better material. I, uh, I tend to overcomplicate things in my own mind. And so, you know, I have to, I don't know, I'm kind of in a catch 22. When I think about things, I, one of my greatest weaknesses is thinking about it and turning over it so much. And then when I get up, a lot of times to preach, it becomes a very convoluted mess because I, I see what I see, but I also see all of these connecting dots where all they connect. And so it's awesome it's to, to me. It's fun to me. But then when you try to deliver a, a message with all those connecting dots, the people that are sitting out there, they don't but they're not seeing what you're seeing. So the thing I've been trying, you know, working on the thing of bunch of time, the thing I've been trying to keep in my mind is, you know, just one, instead of a, a shotgun, it's a, it's a single shot of a rifle. Instead of trying to be scatterbrained, trying to narrow things down to a, a linear train of thought. You know, I can do that sitting in my office thinking about a particular thought and let the shotgun stuff come. Yeah. And trying to deliver it on the fly is a, I don't know why, but it's a little bit more of a challenge for me. Yeah. Well, I think uh, I, I've been through that same thing before too, and I still go through it too, but it, it comes from doing the study and, and well, like anything that you study, you have to learn the basics and then you have to add in all the what is. Now this is true, but what about this situation? What about, there might be something over here that affects it. There might be something over here that affects it. And you gotta go through all those processes. Then when you get up in the pulpit and start to preach, your mind wants you to take them through all the processes as well to get them to that place. And you did that mentally. You didn't do it verbally. 
So when you try to take them through all the all the steps that allowed you to arrive at a conclusion or all the steps that have an effect on the conclusion, having not having not verbalized it before, it's kind of difficult to do. Right. And so I mean it, it's a standard uh, I think it's a standard no matter what you're teaching to teach the basics first and then build on it later and then build on it later. And that later can be later in the sermon or later in the uh, in the course of your, you know, in the course of your tenure. You know, you give the building blocks of whatever you're trying to teach one week and two weeks later come back or in a Sunday school format, you can start off small and enlarge on that subject the next week and enlarge. There's lots of ways you can do it, but a lot of times a sermon is different from a from a, a a teaching course, a course of learning, in that the sermon you're trying to present a big idea right now, <laughs> and so teaching and preaching. I think we've mentioned this before, but teaching and preaching are two different animals, and and a and a preacher has to be apt to teach. So you got to learn. You got to learn both of them, and we learn by doing. And some stuff comes with experience and some stuff is always difficult. It's always difficult for me to teach because I'm not a very educated person. I don't have that much, um, I don't have that much association with the educational process. So it'd be a little bit diff difficult for me throughout because I have to go back and keep learning lessons about simplifying things and, and building on those simple ideas. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, thankfully, God didn't call the noble and the 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 great wise uh, people who have all their uh, T's dotted and their I's crossed. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but at any rate, brother, I, I think we'll cut it off right here, and we'll be praying for you stuff that's upcoming. Uh, pray for us over our. Uh, ladies meeting that's always a big deal with the ladies here they they seem to enjoy it and they really get something out of it so let's be praying over that and i'll pray over uh, we'll be praying over your meeting that uh, with brother mark mcgahee coming up you give me the, the you give me the dates every week but give them to me one more time for the benefit mm -hmm. of of the people that's listening it's uh, october 10th through the 15th October. October the 10th through the 15th. I, I wonder if you have the 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 dates for uh, January. We did February last. I don't suppose I, you've made that up yet. I don't have them yet. I did call Brother Mark about that. Um, uh, it was late last week, Friday or Saturday. Uh, and I was trying to get worked out because of where the meeting falls this year. It's kind of, it's right there at, new year's and he's got to be somewhere to preach a watch night service so i told him i'd give him till today or tomorrow to give me a call back and if i didn't hear from him i'd call him back and try and get that ironed out want to give him a chance to work his schedule out so hopefully lord willing this week we'll hear about that whether we're going to do it the first week second week or how how all that's going to roll out so. yeah that's good that's good all right well god bless y'all down there brother we'll be praying for you We'll talk to you. If not before then, we'll talk to you next Monday. All right. Take it easy. All right, brother. We'll see you.